okay? Electronic Bibles. Good deal. No Bibles. All right, good job. Good job, good job, good job. Turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. I don't know how far I'm going to get. I don't know that it matters. I'm going to try. That's all I can tell you. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And while you're turning there, because I've been told I need to give you more time. How many has the 66 books of the Bible memorized in order? Hold it up. Who does not? Okay. We, we have a project. We have a project. So while you're turning to the table of contents, let me give you a short story to catch you up. There was two children who grew up in a pastor's home. I'm not talking about my kids. These, these boys were born into a long line of preachers. And they grew up hearing about the Lord every day of their lives. In fact, when they were grown, they too went into full-time ministry. The great tragedy is that with all this privilege, neither of them actually knew God. They knew a lot about religious activity. They were even trained for ministry. Their father knew the Lord. Yet all the exposure to the things of God somehow never reached their hearts. I'm talking about the sons of Eli, Hopney and Phineas. They were ministering in the highest priestly offices at the temple, and yet they did not know God. I'm going to pause here. Lyric, I want you and your brother up here. Come on. Come on. You're going to you're going to fill into my example real quick. Sit right here. These reserve seats are just for you today. Have a seat. Hopney and Phineas were brothers that heard about God every day. Okay? For you, you're hearing about God every Thursday and every Sunday for sure. And then whatever dad's dad's teaching you. Right? And with all the time that they had hearing about God, they never let it get past their ears and down into their heart. And what happens when you have kids that keep God from the neck up instead of allowing him to get down into their spirit? They start as kids that become adolescents, that become adults that have learned how to contain God between their ears instead of in their heart. So I want to be really clear with you. I am, I am very aware that I'm dealing with a mixed crowd. And I'm dealing with some that really just want to give it all to Jesus. And they're hungry and they're, 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 they're seeking after God with everything that they know how to do. And then we have some that are just spectators and just want to come and see if this church really has what, what it says on the sign. But then we got a lot of people that are just professional Christians. And they've learned how to do the stuff. And they don't know him. Guys, I'm telling you, I've heard my whole life, we're living in the last days, we're living in the last days, we're living in the last days, we're living in the last days. I've got a, I've got a lifetime of hearing that we're in the last days. But instead of saying, well, maybe not, I'm going to continue to say we're in the last days. Because if we were in the last days when I was born, we're definitely in the last days where I'm at today. You, you get what I'm saying? Here's our problem. We in America have learned to procrastinate. And we have this thing that I just want to live my life. I just want to have fun. 
And what we're doing is we're selling our birth, 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 I'm trying to say birfa, <laughs> trying to sell our birthright for soup. You want to know what fun is? Going to bed guilt-free and waking up the same. <laughs> I, I don't have to wake up and go, how am I going to cover up what I did last night? I, I don't have to worry about any of that mess. Why? Because I wasn't doing anything. It had to be covered up. Anybody hear anything I'm saying to you? It's like people don't even know what that kind of living is anymore. Oh, you're going to go into that holding this stuff, and now you're going you're gonna to beat people up tonight and tell them how they're just living wrong. And no, what I'm going to say is God does not like being locked up in your front yard like a pooch. He wants access to the whole house of who you are. He wants access into every room of who you are, and it's our responsibility to give it to him because he's either going to get what he wants or he's going to give us what we say we want by the way we're living our life. See, I'm walking a, I'm walking a tightrope today because I want to give you an absolute truth, but do it with an attitude that's not only appear before God, but that draws you in. I'm not trying to uh, intentionally offend you, though I probably am going to offend some. My goal is not offense. My goal is to lasso some folks that's been floating outside the ship and thinking that because the ship is in eyesight, they're okay. First Samuel 2. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. What's Belial, you say? I'm so glad you asked. Belial means destruction without profit, worthlessness, and wickedness. The sons of Eli were sons of worthlessness, destruction, wickedness, and without profit. That's a chilling thought. I need you to hear that just because you're around the things of God does not mean that you've opened your heart to the things of God. And in fact, familiarity with what is holy and sacred is dangerous. A person can begin to take for granted, well, yeah, we were in church just Sunday. Man, the presence of the God was thick. And, it was, and you know all the right things to say. And it doesn't mean that God wasn't here. And it doesn't mean the presence of God wasn't thick. It just means that you didn't know how to receive it. You knew from what everybody else was saying and doing, God was in the house. But you didn't feel him. You didn't see him. You didn't touch him. He didn't touch you. You sat there like a bump on a log and watched everybody else get blasted so you could go out on Facebook and say, wow, God was in the house. House. Didn't mean you knew him. I don't know what you guys do to me. When you begin to treat the things of God as common, then you do what happened in 2 Samuel 6, verse 6. Listen, guys, it shouldn't take you long to get there. We were just in 1 Samuel. Move a few pages over to 2 Samuel. You're almost there, okay? 2 Samuel 6, verse 6. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark to steady the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. When you begin to treat the presence of God, oh, when you begin to treat the presence of God as common, then you're in danger, not, not just of not being blessed. You're in danger of losing your breath. Oh, well, that was, that was the old covenant. Same God. I am God and I change not. His covenant with man has changed because we have better promises. But just because we have better promises doesn't mean you should treat God with less honor and revere than they did in the Old Testament. I'm going to tell you this. Those people that know anything about God truly understand the scripture where it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what that means? That means when you, when you are so terrified 
that your whole body shakes and you can't stop it. You're not cold. You're just freaking out. You need to make a choice in that zone of recognizing if I make the wrong decision here, it can be the end for here and eternity. Anybody hear anything I'm saying? You, you have to work. Listen, you, you can't get to heaven on my theology. You can't get to heaven on my walk with God, on my relationship, on my prayers, on my anything. you got to get to God on your own. We're all here together in the house. I didn't bring you. Some of you got brought. Thank God for that. Some of you brought yourself. Thank God for that. But it wasn't on me that got you here. It was on you that got you here. Same way getting to heaven. The only way you get into heaven is you're going to drive yourself, walk yourself, crawl yourself right up to the pearly gates. You cannot come in on my, you can't pull out a church card and say, but, but, but I went to this church. People in ministry have got to remind themselves of the honor that's due God. Guys, it freaks me out sometimes when I stand behind here. And I realize that there's people that are making decisions that's affecting their forever based on what I'm saying. That's why I can't go with popular theology. That's why I don't care if I hurt some little boy's feelings every now and again. I'd rather hurt their feelings and break their will a little bit in church than I would to see them go straight to hell because I didn't tell them something. I'm going to tell you what, parents ought to do the same thing. Break the board over their back end for crying out loud. Do something to wake their spirit man up. Drive that evil spirit away from them. I ain't got time to go there. We cannot presume upon God's grace. Does God have grace? Yes. Is it available for us? Yes. But you've got to meet the qualifications. Number one, you've got to be his. Number two, you've got to come to him with a contrite heart and spirit that says, Lord, I'm broken over the fact that I was stupid and I shouldn't have done that. And grace is available for you. Grace is not like the government handing out how much you need, how much you need. That's not what's going on here. You can't just walk up in the line and say, I'm, I'm due grace because I'm living and breathing and I didn't ask to be here. That's not how grace works. In fact, the Bible says if you continue to sin knowing that you shouldn't be doing that, is there any more grace for sin? No, none, nada, zero, uh-uh. Grace is for those who have a contrite heart. It's the empowerment, the enablement of God to continue to live a righteous life no matter how many times we fall. That's not what's being preached in a lot of pulpits today. Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. I don't know if you've ever considered what you'd do if the government in your lifetime comes to the door and puts an automatic weapon in your mouth and says, denounce Jesus and live. Confess him and die. And everybody in the room today would say, oh, I... I'm out. No. You, you, you want to know what hits my mind? Where's my wife? Where's my kids? Where's my family, my extended family? If they take me out, I'm not available for them. That's a, that's a father, priestly, protector. That's the stuff that goes. I'm, I'm not even worried about where I'm going to be. I know where I'm going to be. It's not about me. But those things come flooding through, and the fear of what's going to happen to them without me is what the enemy tries to use in that last moment to get you to say something wrong. Let me just say this. Just because they say they're not going to kill you if you denounce Jesus doesn't mean they're not going to kill you if you don't denounce Jesus. They could absolutely, they could slip and, I, oh, did I do that? Eh, sorry. 
and you say, no, I'm going to denounce him just so I can live because I need to get over there. You think you're playing the system, but you denounce him and boom, they kill you anyway. You can't play with that. You hear anything I'm saying? And guys, I'm talking like this because that day is on the fast track here. That day just hit the, the Crisco slide and is, it is, is sliding right into the present. I cannot afford to be a pastor to a group of people that are spiritual ninnies. There are people in this neighborhood that are going to hell. It doesn't matter how many people are in this house, how many people fill the parking lot, or how many signs we have, how many lights or hot dogs we cook. I've never bought a Schwab's hot link that jumped itself out of the package and onto the grill because it wanted to be a delicious meal for me. And I've never seen a neighborhood of people that just occurred to them one day, I think I'd like to go to the church in the middle of our neighborhood and see if I can't meet with God today. It takes an invite. And we're so consumed with all the information and knowledge we have about God, we're so consumed with trying to make heaven ourselves, we don't give a flying flip about all the people that are dying this week in a stone's throw from the building. Hopney and Phineas learned the mechanics of ministry. But their heart was far from God. Let me talk to you for a minute about that. When I had Todd Bentley come out, I took some heat. Some from people that were distant, some from people that were up close. But I, I took some heat. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that. I'm just going to say I, I went with what I felt in my spirit I was supposed to do, and I have no regrets. I believe God showed up. I believe that people were healed, ministered to, set free, delivered, and, um, and a great relationship, too, in fact, have been birthed. Well, maybe more than that, but at least two uh, with Todd and with Joshua were birthed out of, the, out of that meeting. Um, I can imagine some people saying, well, I can do that. I can do what Todd does. I can throw a few scriptures out, get a rag full of oil and slap it on people and let God do whatever. Let me, let me, t let me tell you how this can work. I believe with all my heart that Todd carries an anointing, okay? And I believe that when he prayed for people, he was releasing that intentionally into the lives and bodies of those that were willing recipients. Let's take Todd out. And let's put an imposter in. So the imposter grabs a rag full of oil, says, come on up. You guys want to be healed? And so you come up, watch, not with faith in the man, but faith in God. God can, oh, God. God can bypass the man because you're reaching out to him in faith. And you can still get the miracle that the imposter thought came through him but really bypassed him to get to you. So I'm saying that there's more than one way to get, to, to get or to catch or to receive a miracle. So that really complicates things because there will be people that will say, well, sure, Todd prayed for people, but God bypassed him. And then there's other people that would say, no, well, listen, you know, God used him to release that into their life. Here's what I want to tell you. The miracles that I saw happening when he was here, no matter who or how many times we prayed about those in the past, didn't occur before he got here. So I'm just, in my mind, I'm, I'm writing them in the columns. You, you hear what I'm saying? So I need you to grasp that is it possible for some people to learn the mechanics how to, how to call for people to come out, how to, how to pray in, in just the right tone or in just the right nonchalantness or what. Yeah, you, you can learn a system and you can imitate a man, but we were never called to learn a system or to imitate a man. We were called to have a covenant with God and to imitate him. 
That's our call. That's why I love the fact that Todd, short, bald, bold beard, tattoos everywhere, and has a little bit of an accent, and has his own mannerisms. He can't preach for that lifted his hand, and if this hand gets pulled down, then the other one's up in the air. But God uses his personality and his traits to do something significant. And I don't have to act or be like Todd in order to get those kinds of results. God chose to use me, just like God's choosing to use you. So what I'm saying is, is it possible to learn mechanics and not carry the anointing? Yes, because even people that are coming for healing can carry the anointing. So I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm trying to open this thing up to say not everybody that Hyundai Shundai's is full of God. Not everybody that fills a pulpit is called by God. Not everybody has apostle in front of their name even knows what apostle is. Matthew 15, 8, the people draw nigh to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How many has ever been courted? Somebody's taking you out on a date, or you're out, you're out on a date with somebody else, and they're saying all the right stuff because they want to get to an expected end. And so they, you know there's no connection. They ain't loving you. They, they're not, they're, they're, there's nothing in them. That says, I want to be a sacrifice to bless you. There's everything in them that says, I want to take everything I can from you before tomorrow morning. We got a lot of people treating God that way. <laughs> Coming to church and saying, listen, I've just had a bad week and I just need something from God. So let me just come on down there like a prostitute and see what I can't just steal from him. That's what's happening in churches all over the world. Because too few people are standing up and saying, you know what? You want to love God, then love God. You want to serve God, then serve God. But quit asking for what true sons and daughters get just because you've had a bad week or a bad life. You want what God's got? Fine. Get adopted and you have everything that, he, that he's got. But you've got to be willing to be adopted, which is to give up your name, your identity, who you think you are and how you think things ought to be done. And you've got to submit yourself to the one that knows more. Where's that teaching today? First Samuel chapter 2 descri describes some of the corruption of these men, Hopney and Phineas. They were not just taking the priest's portion of the sacrifices made at the temple. They were actually taking what they wanted when they wanted it and as much as they wanted it. They would even take it by force if necessary. So I'm going to say this, when you're dealing with sacred things of God, you better tread softly. Tread softly. Tread respectfully. See, we are accepted by the Father through Jesus. Uh, we're accepted by the Father but we have to go through Jesus. So if you try to get to the Father outside of Jesus, no go. In fact, it's only because we bear the image and the likeness and the smells and the tastes and everything else of Jesus that we're not squashed immediately when we call out to Yahweh. You guys hear what I'm telling you? You have to go through Jesus to get to the Father. That's the only way that it works. Jesus taught us by example how to relate to the Father. So you can't use him as an Uber to get to the presence of, of the Father because you need to be just like him to get into his presence. Listen, regardless of which spectrum that you're on, love him, can't stand him, pray for him, abhor him, whatever. If you are going to meet Joe Biden, there are rules. There is etiquette. 
there is a dress code. There are things that you can say, cannot say, should say, should not say. There are certain things that if you say, you out. I've known of people that, that didn't care for Obama either, and they posted some stuff on, on Facebook just shooting off their mouth until the Secret Service knocked on their door and said, I'd like you to explain your post. Because there are certain things you cannot say. And yet we think, watch, because of grace, I can talk to God any old way that I want to. <laughs> Let me step away from you while you do what you believe you can do. You obviously missed the passage. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You missed that part. You slept through class that day. This is why I speak to the fact of honoring God. This is why I'm not letting kids just hang out in the back and play tiddlywinks and text and laugh and cut up and goof off. That's why they're on the front row. They may be angry at me. They might be just as mad as their hair is red, and that's okay. But they're going to go home tonight knowing a little bit more about Jesus than they did before they got here. You want to know why? Because that's my responsibility. You want to know why else? Because it's yours too. Quit letting them do it. And I'm not just talking about these two. I'm picking on them because they can take it. Believe me. I heard about y'all at camp. I know you can take this. Psalm 11, serve ye Jehovah with fear and rejoice with trembling. Psalm 2, verse 12. I'm sorry, that was not Psalm 11. That was Psalm 2, verse 11. And now verse 12. Kiss the chosen one. Lest he be angry. That's Jesus. And you lose the way when his anger burneth a, litter, a, a little. Oh, the happiness of all trusting in him. Keep Jesus happy with you. It's something that the issues from the heart of a person who enjoys intimacy with God. It's something that comes natural because they desire a relationship. Listen, if I want a relationship with you, but I just want to see how far I can push it. So I talk about everything you don't like to talk about. I talk about motorcycles, fast cars, motors. I, I talk about the type of oil, viscosity. I talk about stuff you could not give a flying flip about. What kind of relationship are we going to have? We're not. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with prayer. There's a way to approach God. Have you ever been taught that? Listen, you young men, you need to know how to approach a young lady. You don't walk out, what's up, babe? Can I have your digits? <laughs> don't work. If it does work, she's not for you. Hear what I'm saying. There's a way to approach God. It changes our concept and our mindset when I, when I'm, God, I'm thank, thank you that I have life and I have breath. Thank you I have a roof over my head. Thank you today, God, that even when it's a little hotter than the way I like it, that we have fans and air conditioning that works and we got shade. Thank you we got cold water. You know how many people I pass on the road today that are out there parched and dehydrated with no water, no Gatorade, no nothing? And yet we'll dare complain, well, it's about four degrees hotter than I, I like it in church. Fix it or I'm gone. Huh? We got to learn how to approach God. We got so many people that come to God with their hand out, but I need. But Lord, I need you to fix, and I need you to take care of, and I need you to, I, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. And God is saying, listen, I, 
I'm everything that you need. You don't have to tell me what you need because I'm him. <laughs> I'm the one you need. But I don't come because you demand it. I come because you court me in your life, because you show that you want me in your life. Not just by the things you say, but how you live your life. Every day that ends in day. You can speak openly and freely before the Lord. I'm not saying you can't. But I'm saying you better never forget who it is you're talking to. He got on to Job. He said, you better watch that mistaken tone of distrust that's coming out of your mouth right now. I'm about to slap it out of you. See, the, the deeper your intimacy is with God, it's not the more you flaunt how you can talk to him. The deeper your intimacy is with God, the more awed you are by his presence. <laughs> So that you wind up talking even more reverently and more respectfully and more cautiously than you ever did when you first got saved. And if you're not, then I question the authenticity of your relationship with Jesus. See, the more you know him, the more you love and respect him. That's an old song. The more that I love, that's an old, whew. The more you know him, the more you love and respect him, and the more de defensive you are about his honor. Listen, you want to see me come up out of my skin? Say something bad about my wife or kids. I will slap the devil smooth out of your life in a heartbeat. But I'm going to tell you what, I will turn into another man. You start, you start lying on God. That's what gets me so irritated about people with the rainbows and saying how God approved. No, he did not. No, he did not. You cannot take the symbol of his promise and then twist it into be some garbage that you want to do in your own life. That's lying on my God. Where are the people that are standing to defend the honor of what God says? I, you don't even have to question. You read it black and white. You don't need some special dispensation or revelation from God that twists the truth of his word. Read it. Hopney and Phineas, they wanted none of this respect business and honor before God. They were greedy ministers. They abused their office. God had already assigned and given them plenty. There really is an appropriate portion for those that function in ministry. And I know some people get upset. Well, that pastor, he don't deserve that. He don't need that much money. He don't need to live in a house like that. And that. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. For the, uh, for the honor of standing before God and having to give an account for how I treated, watched over, prayed for, and protected you, I'll be honest, I'll take what I get in this life. You hear what I'm saying? There's, there's a stricter judgment for me than for you. So some of y'all want to grab a microphone and preach and teach and holler and scream and all that kind of stuff because you think that'd be cool. To, I can do that. You need to be careful. You need to be careful. I got to make sure every night before I lay my head to the bed, am I okay? Am I okay? <laughs> am I okay? Is there something wrong here? Fix it in me, Jesus. You hear anything I'm saying? And I love how people love to use Joel Osteen and uh, T.D. Jakes. And uh, see all these pastors. Okay, you can name a half a dozen that's all over, got a huge ministry. And 99.9999999% of all the other ones, most of them are living in poverty. Do you hear what I'm saying? Quit it. I'm not speaking to you directly. Let me look at the camera. Quit it. Paul was saying this on, on how to, uh, about uh, Hopney and Phineas. He was saying also in 1 Corinthians 9, 9, 1 Timothy 5, 18, when he quoted Deuteronomy 25, 4, you shall not muzzle an ox while he treads out the grain. If a, if a minister is faithfully doing his duty, he deserves not just reasonable compensation. The scripture says double honor. 
the oxen were allowed to eat some of the grain while they did their service. But Hophni and Phinehas got greedy and used their power just to take what they wanted without restraint. You want to you know, when I talk to people outside and ask them why they're not in church, many of them are church hurt because of the abuses of the pastoral leadership. You know what my response is to them? My job is to love you. Honestly, we ought to have, so, sometimes we've had bad relationships. Guys, you get a broken woman that, that you fall in love with, understand that God has put in you what it takes to put that Humpty Dumpty back together. Ladies, you get a broken man who's been, who's been messed up and, and times passed and God brings you two together. God's put in you what it's going to take in order to put all those pieces back and heal that back together. And you've got to know, even as a pastor, I'm finding myself in that same zone where I'm finding people that are in the wake of other ministers and ministries and, and they, they want nothing to do with, with church, with God, and especially me. And I just have to look at them and say, listen, I'm here to love you. I want nothing from you. Some of my favorite videos even today is to watch these, these dogs that have been abused and how, they, how the, the new owners earn the trust of the, of the dog. I love watching that. And you know what? They're in it for the long haul. They know it's going to take days and days. They'll sit with their back to that animal, throwing them little treats and just trying to get just a little touch. They're growling and, and barking and biting them. And I mean, they got bites all over their hands, bloody. They knew, they knew that going in. And guys, I know sometimes going in, this is going to hurt. This is going to get a little bloody. I'm going to lose some life over this deal. I, I understand what, what, what's in it here. But I'm willing to give that commitment. Why? Because God gave me a straw and he said, put that in the ocean of my love and you'll never run dry. So I have an endless supply of whatever other people need that I just have to be a distributor for. You see what I'm saying? I've always wondered how California could ever be in a drought. They're butted up to the ocean for crying out loud. Get a big diesel desalinization machine and put a hose out there and strip the, the contaminants out and have you water. How do you have a drought anyway? It's kind of like people in church. How do you ever have a drought? How do you ever have a drought? Oh, I've just been so, I've been so hot. You just, shh. Have a cold drink. Hobney and Phineas got greedy. They had no restraint. They were even having sex with women that came to the temple. This was, this was, this was heinous. But for Hobney and Phineas, it was even more widespread than that. These sins would be egregious even if they were done outside the temple, but they were doing it in the temple gates. It was particularly dishonoring to God when done in that context by men who were supposed to be representing Jesus. 1 Samuel 2, 17 says, their sin was very great before the Lord. See, we're all held to a standard of holiness. I know you felt good that, that pastors have to take a lot of the heat, but that doesn't absolve you of the heat that's coming your way when you're given the holiness test before God. Spiritual leaders are held to a higher standard and a stricter judgment. I get that. James 3, 1, do not all be teachers, my brothers, because we teachers will be judged more hardly than others. That's why we just don't willy-nilly throw people in positions. Not everybody ought to be doing it. These young men were reported or reportable to their father Eli. Watch this. Eli knew the Lord. Nobody denies that. Eli knew the Lord. He was genuinely called to the ministry. But Eli was indulgent and undisciplined. He was also indulgent towards his sons. Eli heard about what they were doing. And God told him, fix it. So here's what he did. Remember we talked about this on Father's Day? Here's what he did. He pulled them down and tried to reason with them. Now, boys, really, you need to kind of slow your roll. Stop doing all the stuff in the temple. Quit trying to take all of God's meat and all the choice stuff out of the, out of the, out of the bowl there. Quit getting into the showbread. Quit robbing the safe. I need you boys to play nice. God's watching. I had a grandma used to threaten to go cut a switch nearly every day I was at her house. Did she ever? No. She ever swap me? No. Did she threaten it all the time? Here's what happens, parents, when you threaten and don't follow through. 
you get the respect of Eli. You be in the midst of a threat, and their eyeballs are rolling so bad, they've already done a 360 in the back of their head. Because they know good well you ain't going to do nothing. You can spit and cough and hack and snort and make a bunch of dust. And Here's another thing. I don't, I don't know what you guys are doing to me. Some, some of you kids are just brazen enough to say, do it, and I'll call the cops. If I got to go spend a little time in the clink in order to teach my kids I mean what I say, bring it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because daddy's got bail money. And if you think what got me in jail is going to get me in trouble, just wait till daddy bails out. You guys didn't even hear anything I'm saying. Listen, because, because when you bow your knee to everything that's unholy instead of what God says that he's holding you responsible to to your own kids, but Lord, they're going to put me in jail. Like there's no precedent for that in Scripture. Some of y'all going, I came on the wrong night. Eli did nothing to stop it. He had a lot of talk. But God held Eli accountable for his sons and what they did. Parents, you better hear me. God's holding you accountable for your little hellions. In fact, in 1 Samuel 2.29, no, let me, I, I was going to skip it. I'm not going to skip this. I'm just not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ha- get to the halfway mark, and those of you that are gluttons, I'll see you on Sunday. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. This is Old Testament. You listening, boys? I want you to hear this. It's important. Deuteronomy 21, 18, if a man has a son who's hard-hearted and uncontrolled, who gives no attention to the voice of his father and mother and will not be ruled by them, though they give him punishment, verse 19, okay, y'all, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book, verse 19, then let his father and mother take him to the responsible men of the town. God help me today. To the responsible men, not the irresponsible ones, not the deadbeats, not the ones not paying child support, not the ones that are absentee dads. Take them to the responsible men of the town in a public place and say to them, this son of ours is hard-hearted and uncontrolled. He will not give attention to us. He gives himself up for pleasure and strong drink. And then he is to be stoned to death by all the men of the town so that you are to put away the evil from among you and all Israel hearing of it will be full of fear. You want to know why there's not a lot of discipline going on and why nobody has any fear of anything else that's going on? Because there's no punishment for wrongdoing. It got to be real popular. You're not the boss of me. Some of you probably said that. Hear what I'm saying? There is order in the things of God. It's not to strut my stuff. It's because there's an order on how we approach God, how we receive from God, how we hear from It's all about order. Watch, God is not going to speak to you because you go, I've been praying for a whole week. I fasted video games for five hours, and you haven't spoken to me. And God's like, oh, 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 let me, let me give you this word. I'm so sorry, withheld it. Really? That's not how God does it. It's like, you must not want it bad enough. It's like, it's like when I tried to feed, uh, uh, feed somebody that was on the street, and I said, listen, I'm going down to the sub shop. What do you want? I don't like that restaurant. Then don't eat, because I do. (laughs) 
He go, well, that's mean. You should have given him what he wanted. No, he, he wasn't hungry enough. He wasn't, a hun- he wasn't hungry enough to want what it, was, what it was necessary in order to have life. And if you don't come to God the way he says come to God, you ain't hungry enough for what he's carrying. You all are messing me up tonight. So 1 Samuel 2, 29, God comes to Eli, and he says, listen, why do you honor your sons more than me? It wasn't Eli sleeping with the women. It wasn't Eli stealing from the, from the meat that was sacrificed. It wasn't Eli that was taking the money. But God said to him, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering? See, in God's eyes, Eli was just as guilty as though he were doing the sins with his sons. Why? Because he was responsible for them. Are you guys getting an understanding of what I'm trying to say right now? If I'm going to be held responsible for you, <laughs> you, you better hear me. We're going to work together. We're going to work this out. Are we going to work you gone? You hear what I'm saying? Why? Because God has a tight ship. Why? Because I want to be a ship that God wants to bless and pour his spirit out on and open the heavens open us uh, over us. That's what I want. I don't want the ones that's in the storm like Jonah that's just waving, just trying to survive. Oh. Where'd your brother go? Uh, I'm about up, boy, some depends. There's a lesson here in how God deals with sin. God dealt with Eli's conscience, and Eli's response was to talk to his boys. Eli had an opportunity to deal with sin. I'm going to tell you what, if God was on me about disciplining my boys, and I knew that I was in trouble if I didn't. You, Jesus with a cat of nine tails in the temple ain't got nothing on me, brother. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to beat the skin off them because you're going to understand it because I'm not getting it from God. I'll give it to you before I get it from God. Anybody hear anything I'm saying to you? You want to know why most people don't do that? Because they don't believe God will. They don't believe. You ain't going to do it. you like grandma. Threaten me all the time. You ain't. God has a history of using people that don't even love him to bring discipline to his own kids. I've said it jokingly in times past, jokingly. But somebody said, you know, that person, they keep messing with my family, they just keep causing all this to I said, you know, I still got some friends in the biker community, and they don't necessarily know Jesus. rang a lang God did it. God did it. He brought people in that didn't know him, didn't love him, didn't even know that they were doing what God told them to do and taught Israel a lesson more than once. <laughs> so for the, some of y'all looking at me saying, you ain't the boss at me, God get you. God will get you. See, there's a lesson here, and here's the crux of what I'm trying to get to for today. There's a lesson here in how God deals with sin. He told him, take care of your sons, get, get rid of the problem. And at that point, it was Eli's responsibility to do just that. Then God sent a prophet to warn Eli because judgment was coming because he hadn't obeyed the word of the Lord. And then there was yet another opportunity for Eli to take the appropriate action when God used a young boy by the name of Samuel to give him a word from God. I want to tell you something. God is not limited in how he speaks to people, and he's not limited in how he speaks to leadership. 1 Samuel 2.27, Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest. 
to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore, says the Lord God of Israel, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will ever reach old age. And you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength. And all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hopney and Phineas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him in a, for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread and plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. You don't want to mess with God. Do not mess with God. Don't think that you can play chicken with him. This is why I have a problem with people that just want to, well, I just want to, I just want to recommit. No, you just got out of jail. You ain't got no money. You ain't got no house. You, you're sleeping in a car in a cardboard box. You're coming to Jesus because you're desperate. And I'll take you like that. But understand, if I see this as a pattern, there's going to be a problem with the Lord. He's going to, he's going to deal with this. I don't mind if God uses circumstance to humble us enough to come before God with an open and contrite heart. But we got to have an open and contrite heart. Eli kept letting the warnings pass. So finally, God stopped speaking prophetically to him. <laughs> the prophetic is not always to encourage you and to slap you on the back and tell you how wonderful you are and that you're going in the right direction. Sometimes a prophetic word is to jerk the slack out of your chain and say, hey, stupid, wake up because you're going the wrong way. Prophetic words can be a blessing. They can, make, they can feel as though they're not a blessing. Even when it's a jerk the slack out of your chain, it's still a blessing even though it stings. But if you think that every prophetic word is always going to be, oh, flowers and roses and peace and joy, and then you missed the point. You haven't read your Bible. God is laying out a pattern. I'm going to speak to you. If you don't pay attention, I'm going to sing your prophetic word. You don't pay attention to that, I'll bring even a young person to you with a, with a word directly from me that, that reads your mail. And if you ignore all of that, judgment is at your door. Some of you have already been ignoring God. Some of you have already heard the prophetic words. Just because Eli got three don't mean you get three. Maybe that's all you get, God speaking directly in a prophetic word. Listen, there's a reason why I take prophetic words seriously. You guys do understand that the reason that no excuses is, is in the flesh and happening right now as a church body is in large part because of a, of a prophetic word that I got in Austin, Texas through Dennis Rainier that when the word was released, I knew in my spirit I had to obey that. So this teaching would not be happening here in this forum with this people if it had not been for a prophetic word. Y'all aren't even hearing it. I don't know what season that you're in right now. I don't know if you're just in the point where God is speaking to you. I don't know if you're at the point where God has been releasing prophetic words into your life. I don't know if you're in a season where he's doing the unusual to get your attention. But I'm going to encourage you to stop letting the warnings pass. Warnings are a warning on purpose. Despise not prophesy. Guys, I have a hard time with people that, that denounce the gifts. 
I struggle with them. Not theologically, not personally, but it's like, how do you serve God without the tools he gave you to serve God? How do you do that? How do you do that? The short answer is you don't. God gave gifts to men on purpose, and it's for us to use them. Thank God for prophetic words. Thank God for healings and signs and wonders. Thank God for miracles. Thank God for words of encouragement. Thank God for all the things that he gave to us individually and corporately. But I'm going to tell you this too. God's tired of everybody bellying up to the table. And nobody wanting to help set the table, clean the house, sweep the floor, do the dishes. Everybody has a part to play. When I was growing up, I may not have even been old enough to do the dishes, but I, I sure enough knew how to drag that sack out to the trash can. I may not have been proficient enough to wash the dishes, but I knew how to take them off the table and put them in the sink. Everybody has a part to play. Everybody. How many of you would just acknowledge just a, a moment of, of honesty? The Lord's been dealing with you about something that you've just been ignoring it. Let me see your hands. Hold it up. Hold it high. Hold it high. Hold it high. I want to see what I'm talking to. Hold, oh, my goodness. Hold it high. Hold it high. Let me look over here. Okay. How many of you have gotten to the stage where you ignored it long enough that he sent you a prophetic word? How many is in the prophetic word stage? Let me see those hands. Hold it high. You bashful people. It's not like I don't know it. Okay. When God is endeavoring to garner your attention when you're, when you're trying to ignore him, how many has ever been, you, you played playfully with your, with your significant other, your, your, your husband, your wife, your whatever, and so, I'm not listening. No, I'm, no, I'm not listening. So you write it on a whiteboard and go. <laughs> playing a game. So, so sometimes I think, we, 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 we're, we're treating God like, ah, oh, no, I don't like that. Not that, that. Obviously, Lord, you sent that to the wrong address. That word, is, that word is not from me. So he brings a billboard, a license plate, a bumper sticker, a commercial, uh, a movie, uh, a, a line. All of a sudden, he just brings it in front of your face. And you go, oh, man. Listen, if I have to take my job seriously, you better bet your bottom dollar I'm going to see to it you take yours seriously. I was sitting yesterday morning, and uh, I've been reading a book that I've been using it as a devotion. So I've been, I've been reading a chapter a morning, and I had my Bible sitting right there, and, and I just felt compelled. Just, just oh, I, I just want to tell you something. Just open it up. And I was like, God, you're playing the rush or let game with it. Open it up. So I opened it, and where'd my finger go? James 3 1. Not everyone should be a teacher. What's in this message? James 3 1. Not everyone should be a teacher. Better hear what I'm saying. I, I, I'm watching. I'm watching for God's elevation, not man's. Because man will elevate you straight to hell. <laughs> They'll elevate you so high you fall off the opinion of that it's so high for yourself. It gets so so high up there you lose oxygen. And listen, God is looking for people that are not full of themselves, but they're full of him. Those are the ones that God is elevating to, to places of leadership because he can trust them to do what he says do. You get what I'm saying? He says yes. So if you're in that season where you know God's been talking to you and you've been dragging your feet and then you didn't want to hear what he said so he brought it prophetically and you've been ignoring the, the, the prophecies and now you're seeing words on billboards and bumper stickers and TV commercials, and you know that he's telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, you're in a dangerous, dangerous spot. God does not like to be ignored. This is one of those messages that I'm calling the people to pay attention to what God is saying to you, to you. I don't know how many times that I was growing up and my attention span was about that big. 
And Dad would be trying to show me something. And I'm like, squirrel. <laughs> He'd look at me and say, pay attention. Homework was the worst. I hated homework. Oh, I hated homework. Dad, can you help me? Yeah, yeah, come here. So you got to, hey, pay attention. Oh, sorry. This is that moment. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention to him. Do what you've not been willing to do. Make that your sacrifice before God that I'm going to function in obedience to this because everything in me says I don't, want to, I don't want any part of that. But because you've required it, God, I'm going to do it. Understand that every time you do an act of obedience, there's a blessing in it for you. So if you're in that season that you know you've been dragging your feet and you're, you've been fighting, obeying God, but you're ready to, to submit that, I want you to stand right where you're at. Come on, stand right where you're at. Five, four, three, two, one. See, some of y'all holy people, like, well, I'm standing in my heart. God knows my heart. Yeah, God knows I said stand to your feet. Now, let's lift our hands and surrender. And now I want you to take the next 30 seconds and tell him that, A, you're sorry for dragging your feet, and, B, you're going to do what he told you to do. Come on, you tell him in your own words. Don't think that just because you're on a video watching on a stream somewhere that you can't do this right now. We're making an opportunity here. You take the opportunity right there on the camera. Come on, give it to him. He knows if you're serious or not, too, by the way. You can't trick him. Come on, give it up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, forgive us for disobedience for taking advantage of your grace, for dragging our feet, for being unwilling to do what you said, when you said, and how you said to do it. Forgive us for treating you as less than holy. Forgive us for thinking that we should in any way oppose you. And I'm asking you today, Lord, to take our repentance and our sacrifice today of obedience where we say, God, I choose to do this for no other reason than because you required it of me. I'm asking today, God, that you bless our efforts today to obey you, to follow you, to submit to you, to honor you. I'm asking you today, Lord, to stand up on the inside of your people today and affirm to them today that you're well pleased with the decision. But the decision requires action. The decision requires follow-up. So help us, God, to be amongst those that you find faithful. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. For those of you online, this coming Sunday, July the 2nd, we'd love to have you at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2632 Southwest 39th. Men's Fellowship, Monday, July the 3rd, Schwab's uh, Hot Links. I got some sausages full of cheese and jalapenos, and I've got uh, foot-long, not foot-long, but bun-linked uh, ballparks, full beef that we're going to be cooking up and making available with all the trimmings and fixings. We'd love you to come out, hang out, visit, make relationship, find encouragement, be an encouragement to somebody else, and find a family here. Then on Thursday evening, 6.45 p.m., 2632 Southwest 39th. We'd love to have you here on a Thursday evening as well. So until then, God bless you. Have an incredible evening.